Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar of the Philippine Society for Microbiology. Specifically, this is the first webinar of the Microbiology Consortium. I am Dr. Leslie Michelle Delmacio from the UP College of Medicine, and I will be your moderator this morning. To welcome us to this webinar and give an overview of the Microbiology Consortium activities, let us hear from academician Asuncion K. Raimundo, the Microbiology Consortium Committee Chair. Dr. Raimundo. Thank you, Dr. Dalmacio. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Microbiology Consortium Board, I wish to welcome you all to this webinar. As teachers, we are all challenged on how to transform from face-to-face -face classroom to a blended, flexible, and in some cases, completely remote mode of learning. From the list of registered participants, I am glad that most, if not all, the members, institutions of the Microbiology Consortium are represented. Aren't we glad that we have established this Microbiology Consortium before the pandemic occurred? Now we have a forum by which we can collaborate with each other and, and help each other face the challenge that we are currently facing. We look forward to more webinars or meetings among members on strategies on how we can establish a common open educational resource portal. We have several microbiology subjects to tackle and it would be to the advantage of everybody if we share materials that we will develop or have developed, but we need to act fast as time is of the essence, since we have barely, what, two months before the opening of classes. Anyway, let's get the most out of this first of a series of webinars. We thank Dr. Iris Tan for unselfishly sharing her time and expertise to be our speaker. She spent time poring over microbiology materials and also helped our microbiologist panelists in coming up with their presentations. We thank Dr. Balonong and Professor Daniel Ong for accepting to present for, during this webinar and to Dr. Les Dalmacio for moderating this webinar. Of course, to the Microbiology Consortium Board and to the Philippine Society of Microbiology Board led by its president, Professor Joel Cornista, for supporting this activity. May you learn something from this webinar. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raimundo. We are excited for the upcoming activities of the Microbiology Consortium that hope to benefit its members and the Philippine microbiology community. But for today's webinar, we will be listening to three speakers about blended or flexible learning. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box, which you can see below your screen. I hope everyone's ready. The main lecture in the webinar will be about blended learning in microbiology. Delivering this lecture is Dr. Iris Fiel, Isip Tan. Dr. Isip Tan is an MD graduate of the UP College of Medicine and she is specializing in endocrinology. She is one of the proponents of the MS in Health Informatics at UP Manila and also the current UP Manila Director of the Interactive Learning Center. Dr. Iris is known as an advocate of telemedicine and blended learning. Notably, Dr. Iris is the first recipient of the University of the Philippines Gawad Pangulo for Progressive Teaching and Learning. Dr. Isip Tan, the screen is now yours. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so I would like to thank Dr. Raimundo and Dr. Dalmacio for the opportunity to speak with you today. 
my background is internal medicine and endocrinology, but I do remember a bit of microbiology. I hope my teacher is not in the audience. But what I have to share with you today is my approach to flip learning as a way to transform your courses to blended or partly online, or perhaps even to remote learning fully online. I've divided my presentation into three parts. First, to discuss how your course can be redesigned to flip learning. Second, how when we redesign, we should be mindful of the triple alignment of our learning outcomes to our teaching learning activities and our assessments. And finally, a few tools online that I have used and I hope that you may find useful as well. So this is a long definition of flip learning from the flip learning network. And it says, it's a pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from the group learning space to the individual learning space and the resulting group space is transformed into a dynamic, interactive learning environment where the educator guides students as they apply concepts and engage creatively in the subject matter. One thing I will say, there is nothing at all about technology in this definition. It also doesn't say convert your lecture into videos, though videos have been used in flip learning. It does mention direct instruction. Direct instruction is teacher-directed, the stand and deliver the lecture approach. I like flip learning because it espouses a more learner-centered approach where the teacher you might have heard is no longer the sage on the stage but the guide on the side. So I hope this works because I'm going to show a short video that explains where the flip happens in a flipped classroom. Every course that has some face-to-face -face component progresses through a sequence of in-class time and out-of-class time. In a traditional lecture-based class, students are typically assigned material to study before coming to class, but then are expected to sit through a presentation that often covers similar content, and then assign something to do for homework usually on their own. In a flipped class, students have access to the instructor's lectures ahead of time, along with any other background material that they need, which frees up face-to-face -face time to let students seek clarification from instructors, collaborate with peers, and practice applying concepts while getting guidance and feedback directly from experts in the moment when it can help the most. This lets students leave class with an even greater collection of resources and a clearer awareness of what they need to focus on to close any gaps that remain in their learning. For more information on the flipped classroom and other teaching and learning resources, go to ctl.utexas.edu. So it showed us two spaces, the group learning space and the individual learning space. So the group learning space is the context in which students operate when they are working with the formal group. And an example would be when we are together, the teacher and the students in a classroom, usually in the form of a lecture because we are trying to introduce students to new material in our course. This is the traditional model, and it creates an inverse relationship as was shown in the video, because when we ask the students to apply the concepts that we introduce in the lecture, they do it on their own without us there. So what the FLIP is trying to do is to reverse that and have us together with the students when they're doing something more cognitively complex. So for example, if we just shift our lectures to a Zoom, it doesn't change the dynamics much. So the thing with flipped learning is getting us to introduce the material to the students ahead of time in a way that will allow them to discover new things on their own so that when they come to the class, they're likely to be more motivated and to ask questions uh, about the material we have presented them. In the individual learning space, that's the context in which students are working mainly by themselves. And an example would be when we ask them to do problem sets or assignments at home, which I said earlier is already unsupervised in a way. And we are hoping that we were able to equip, the, equip them enough so that they can do the exercises on their own. So the traditional model really does not promote self-regulated learning because it positions the professor as the source and gatekeeper of knowledge. And the hardest work is done by the students alone. 
So some of my students will say, I learn best when I'm lectured to. And I'm trying to challenge them that that's not exactly true. So in flipped learning, we're trying to promote self-regulated learning by the students. And that's even more important now because of the pandemic, because we can't meet them in class. And we wonder, what are they doing at home with our materials? Do we need to meet them synchronously? What happens when we ask them to do asynchronous activities? Sometimes teachers would complain to me at my faculty workshops that students don't listen, and then they just Google. But Google, when you use that, it will give you thousands of resources, and they still need the teacher to tell them not all of that will be true or important or relevant, and this is what I think will be. So the teacher now serves as a navigator for these resources, and this leads to a more social-guided exploration of deeper learning. In class, sometimes we, we go over time because the lecture goes over time, and there's hardly enough time for the students, for example, to ask questions. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to flip that. So we're, we're trying to make the group space, which is so precious now, because we won't know when the pandemic will allow us to meet again. We want it to be a session not just for transmitting knowledge or a feeling of empty cups. So you saw this in the video already. Uh, and in the flipped classroom, we're letting the students prepare ahead to participate in our group time together. And our group time now in the pandemic has been redefined. It's something like this, a Zoom webinar or a Zoom meeting where all of us gather uh, and someone talks, okay? Um, and then out of class, that's asynchronous. So maybe if you were to use the flipped classroom model, uh, we will be able to lessen the hours in school. I'm imagining maybe our students will go on rotation. Uh, so a half of the class will go to the lab today, then tomorrow maybe the other half so that we can comply with um, your social distancing that is required. Uh, and then we need to think about how many synchronous sessions are we going to hold online? Not everyone has good Wi-Fi. Like right now, it's 10 a.m. So what happens if the student only gets a good Wi-Fi access at two in the morning? So what are we going to do then? So we need to be able to prepare material for them that lets them learn even while we're not seeing them. So the flipped learning network describes the flipped learning in the letters F-L-I-P. So they said flip F is for flexible. It allows the learners to learn in different ways and in different speeds because we are learner-centered. I'm sure it has happened to you that sometimes students uh, will look bored or some will actually sleep in class. That has happened to me, definitely. Uh, in medicine, the, the students have transcriptions of my previous lectures, for example, and so they already know the content. And if I don't change it, some of them will not attend and they will say, oh, it wasn't high yield. It's the same lecture as before. But some of them really need to sit in class to listen to me. Why? Uh, because they struggle with it. Uh, and in fact, sometimes they will say, oh, you're going too fast. Can you slow down? So when we curate our resources uh, to put together our curriculum now or our syllabus now, we need to design for flexibility. So in grad school, for example, I'll say, okay, these are the two required readings. However, if the topic interests you, then these are the other readings that you might want to get into. L is for learning culture. So as I said, our group space now, our time together is very precious that we need to use it more wisely. So the students should use precious group space on high impact, meaningful activities that place their work at the center of attention. So last week I had a session with some medical students and they were supposed to report on a case of a patient and they prepared their slide decks, and we had a Zoom meeting, and they were going through their slide decks, but I kept on interrupting them and asking them questions because I felt uh, we needed to go beyond the PowerPoint. So in the end, we worked with a blank PowerPoint slide. I had them demonstrate to me their clinical reasoning, okay? They, they were working together, threshing out the case, so, and they said it was high yield because they hadn't expected it to come out that way. So my questions challenged them and they felt like they were working together as a group trying to solve the case. I is for intentional content. So because we're going to have asynchronous learning, we're going to give what is called course packages. 
uh, to our students or maybe handouts. And we need to lay down that these materials have explicit connections to our learning outcomes that are already clearly stated. So we need to guide them. So for example, if we can't have a lecture, but we have our slide deck, we can't just give the slide deck as this. It would be better if we provide annotations or if we provide the script uh, that you were supposed to say when you were going to deliver the lecture. Uh, if we have them watch a video, how do we let them produce what I call an artifact of learning? How do I know that you learned something when you watch the video? So we need to make it a more active process. P is for professional educator. And I'm happy that your consortium has embarked on a webinar series like this because we all need to retool in this so-called new normal. And even I, I have been doing ed tech for a while. I was more prepared for blended learning and not remote learning. So I also need um, to study what else we can do now in this new normal. So maybe together as a consortium, uh, you can evaluate the performance of certain interactive lessons that some of your members may have created or videos uh, that they have shared with you uh, so that together you can put them together in some sort of a resource um, that has been vetted and is shared by everybody. When we design um, for flipped learning, they call it the backward design. Uh, but that's not really, uh, that's really intuitive by now, I guess, because we've gone through uh, OBE or outcomes-based education, where the first thing that we need to do is identify the desired results at the end. So what should the students know, understand, and be able to do both during and after the course? And then next, determine acceptable evidence that learning or mastery has taken place. What will I accept as sufficient evidence that my student has learned the concept? And that's very important right now, the assessment, because many faculty are asking me, how can we ensure that when they take the online quiz, they are not cheating? Then I said, then we have to make your uh, assessment cheating proof, okay? So maybe it shouldn't be multiple choice questions, for example. Maybe it should be a project or maybe it should be something akin to what we used to have as open notes that it really doesn't make sense. Even if they open all their books, they can't find the answers there. So something like that. And then plan learning experiences and instructions. What activities will create the learning environment in which it is possible, even likely, that the real evidence of progress toward the desired results will happen? So if you ask them to do a project, it may be a manifestation of the integration of the concepts that you taught them so that you don't even really have to give them a quiz. You can see that they understood. So what we're going for is a conceptual understanding, perhaps, or some skills rather than just covering uh, the topics that we have allotted for this course. So there are seven steps. And if you want to know that in detail, you can read the book by Professor Talbert, Flip Learning, A Guide for Higher Education Faculty. But briefly, it entails the following steps. First, you list your learning objectives. And for us, it's our learning outcomes. And then we arrange our objectives according to complexity. Uh, and then we create a rough design of the group activity, meaning if we have this objectives one to five, uh, which ones will I tackle in the synchronous time I have with my students? So that's why number four is split the learning objectives into basic and advanced because you're saying maybe the basic, uh, you can do that on your own before you come to class and the advanced, that's what we're going to do together in our Zoom meeting. And that's why after you've gotten a sense of that, that's the time you finish the design of the group activity. One of the things I've had to deal with in my early years of flipping the class uh, is to be told, you're not teaching the class. You let us, the students, do everything, okay? Which means that you are not able to properly gauge uh, what they needed to do, the minimum that they needed to do so that they can get to the class confident that they will be able to do the group exercise or the group activity that you're going to assign. After that, you design the individual space activity. If I want them to be able to manipulate the microscope, what is it that they need to read 
look at, view on YouTube that tells them the parts of the microscope, etc. So that when they get to the lab, they can more or less handle it more confidently. So that's what you put in the individual space, those resources. And number seven is optional. Do you want them to do something more after that lab exercise? You can design a post-group space activity. In the context of a uh, semester, the post-group activity for this lesson could be the uh, individual space activity for the following lesson. So it's all threaded together. So I'll try to give some examples uh, to make that easier to understand. But as you, you may have experienced, as I had experienced in the last semester, which was abruptly cut off, uh, you will very likely not have enough time to address every single one of your objectives in class. And you will need to make the preliminary choice of which objectives you are not going to explicitly uh, discuss in class or tackle in class, okay? So I looked at the MCB1 general microbiology syllabus that was kindly sent to me. And under microscopy, there's types of microscopes. And I noticed that there were two objectives uh, for the class meeting, which would be to enumerate and differentiate the types of microscope and to associate the microscope type to their specific applications. And then the last three outcomes were for the lab session. So they have to look at the function of the parts, discuss the concept of calibration, compute for calibration factor, etc. So when I was looking at this from a flipped learning design point of view, I was saying maybe one and two, uh, I can give a handout or I can show them a video. And that includes number one for the lab session as well. But number two and three, how will I replace that if I don't have a lab? Or will I make them come to lab but in rotation? So uh, these are things that we can prepare for better if they had the resources for number one and two and uh, number one of the parts of the compound microscope. So what would that look like? So most of us have been giving handouts or maybe we even have laboratory manuals. So that's not any different. What Professor Talbert suggests is that it's not only just a handout of the concepts, but to also provide what he calls guided practice. And when he says you should have guided practice, then it should be minimal, meaning don't uh, put too much material that the student gets overwhelmed, okay? We only need that amount of material that they need to digest before they go to the lab class, for example. It should be engaging. They should feel like they want to go to the lab after reading it because they're excited to try new things. It should be simple and yet productive and failure tolerant. Meaning, if you're going to have some a bit of exercises, so I was thinking in the previous slide, do you want to make them try already computing for the calibration factor or something? It should be relatively easy so they don't get discouraged. And then you'll try to make it more complex when you meet them in class. And there should be instructions for submitting the work. So even though the work is not graded, Professor Talbert says it gives you a cue as a teacher which concepts were not well understood. So some people use Google Forms for their um, modules. And then you can say, like, for example, here I gave a five-point quiz because it's just pre-class work. And number four, so many people didn't get that. So maybe there's a problem with the way I explained number four. And now when I go to the lab class, I have to explain that more to my students. So if you do not lecture, uh, what am I supposed to do with all that class time that is freed up? And Dr. Talbert's answer is do whatever it is you have always wanted to do but didn't have the time. So it's practically a challenge for us to be more creative, especially now in time of the pandemic. So the second part of my presentation has to do with achieving triple alignment from learning outcomes to teaching learning activities and the assessments. So here is what the triple alignment template looks like. Uh, you'll have, for example, the week, if we're talking about weeks in the semester, uh, we'll have the learning outcomes, what should your students be able to do? And then you'll have assessment. Is it formative? You only want to provide feedback to the students so they can improve their learning? Or do you want it to be summative, to provide a grade to the student? So, and then now, because we have the pandemic, 
you have to think, are we going to do this online or in class? Are we going to do it together in a synchronous manner? Or you'll allow them to uh, go off and do the activity by themselves asynchronously? What resources are we going to give to the students? Is it going to be a handout, a slide deck, a YouTube link, a website, etc.? We have to be able to put them together. So this is what I tried to do. So I am not a microbiology teacher. <laughs> so let me know if this works or not. So it says there in week two of the MCB1 syllabus, differentiate the different types of microscopes and associate the microscope type to their specific applications. And I noted that in the syllabus for every topic, it said their quiz, quiz. Uh, but I was thinking, uh, are we going to be able to give quizzes that often or should we just include that this topic, particular topic in the long exam? I don't know. So those are the decisions that you make, right, as a teacher. So I went online and I tried to look for materials for the students. And I found this YouTube channel by the Amoeba Sisters. I don't know if you know them. Uh, and, it, and it's entitled Microscopes and How to Use a Light Microscope. So it's a cartoon, so it's very engaging, I think. Uh, but it gives you the basic information about the types of microscopes. Uh, what happens to those students who do not have a good internet connection, who will not be able to watch the video because it's going to be too slow, it's going to buffer, it's going to stop? Well, we can give them a handout on the types of microscopes. So it will have the same information as the YouTube video. Our challenge now is how to make it as interesting as the YouTube video, even if it's just text-based. And we can send that as a PDF. We can put it on our learning management system, or you can, put it, uh, you can send it via email. And then what happens to synchronous? If there are students who still do not understand uh, the types of microscopes or have burning questions about the microscopes, then you can schedule uh, an online office hour. You can say like, I will be available via Zoom, schedule, email me between two to four on a Tuesday. If you are having problems with the asynchronous activities that I have assigned to you as students. So I found a microscope comparison <laughs> table. Uh, please forgive me if there's something wrong with the parameters I'm trying to compare here. So this is the table comparing the light microscope and the electron microscope and my concept was as they are reading the handout or watching the YouTube video they're filling up this comparison table so it's a way for them to uh, convert it into some form of active learning rather than just plain reading or plain watching the YouTube video I was even thinking uh, can we do some sort of a scavenger hunt because in the bottom part of this I was saying uh, can you supply a sample image Okay, so can I say, uh, look for an organism, a microorganism, and show me what it looks like under a light microscope and under an electron microscope. How many can you find online? And let's make it a game, whoever finds the most number, etc. So gamification is one way uh, of motivating students to capture their interest and make them enjoy uh, the learning experience. So last night I said, could I look for one? And this is what I found. Tama naman po, no? <laughs> so this is the light microscope part, and the other part is the scanning electron microscope of acid-fast bacilli, which I'm sure you all know. So to do that, uh, we're actually going to become curators, meaning we're going to go online, we're going to look for resources, and that's why I'm saying if you have this wonderful consortium, you can divide the work so that it's not hard for everybody. So when I was looking for things to show you today, I was making some decisions. Is it relevant? Uh, do you think they like this, etc.? So we are making curating decisions. What should be on display? And this is a slide deck by Corinne Weisgerber, and you can find it on slideshare.net as well. And she's talking about the steps to become an educator curator. So first you have to find the resources, and then you select. So not so I realized, for example, that those gram stain videos, not everything is correct. <laughs> uh, and maybe Professor Daniel will show us later. Uh, and then editorialize, meaning you can give your opinion. So the video has some mistakes. Uh, tell me where, okay? And then if you have several of these handouts or videos or slide decks, you arrange them in a, in a kind of sequence that makes sense to you as the teacher. Uh, if something is lacking, then that's the time probably we need to create the resource. 
And then we share it to our students. And if you have a learning management system like Google Classroom or Moodle or Canvas or Edmodo, you can track their engagement. Do the students click on this resource? Do they actually read it kaya? Or how come no one clicks or downloaded this part? Okay, so you can tell. So this is what one of my courses looks like. I utilize what is called problem-based learning. So every week I give my grad students a driving question. So example, how can health informatics help the Philippines attain the Alma Ata Declaration of Health for All? Then what do I do? I give them a reading. So here, uh, there's a video uh, and then there's a PDF file. And then I tell them, answer this driving question by creating a sketch note. That for me uh, shows how they integrate their ideas into this one sketch note. And as you notice, I don't just give them the resources. Like if I had a Google Drive, right? I could just say, go to the Google Drive and download it. What I've done here in my learning management system is to annotate. So I'll say, I invite you to reflect, etc. So what are you trying to do here? You're trying to make sure that the student feels your presence, even if he's on his own at home, trying to read this and learning on his own. I want to tell the students, I am here with you in this online learning space, even if it's asynchronous. So I was thinking of an appropriate driving question for microscopy last night. Uh, like, what is the role of microscopy in this pandemic? How do we know coronavirus has spikes? Uh, can we see the coronavirus under a light microscope, etc.? So, you know, I'm not a microbiology teacher, so I'm sure you can come up with more exciting questions for your students. And when I have my slide decks, uh, and it was announced earlier, this particular slide deck I'm using right now talking to you, it's already online. You can find it on slideshare.net slash isiptan. It will be slide deck number 155. So I have 155 slide decks already online. Uh, and it's a decade of my speaking engagements. And people ask me, aren't you afraid someone is going to steal it? Uh, I'm a UP professor. I want people to steal it <laughs> and use it. So all these slide decks have a Creative Commons license. And that was a question that was asked of me because when you start curating, how do you know you're not illegally using something? So you have to check for the license of that resource. And if it's something like this, attribution required, non-commercial, share alike, which is what I use, uh, then uh, you, you need to only attribute. So you'll, like you'll say, I'm going to use the slide of Dr. Isiptan. So I'm going to have to say this is a slide by Dr. Isiptan and then I cannot use it commercially uh, and then I will have to share it as free as she did. Okay? Have you seen this? Who led the digital transformation of her company? <laughs> COVID-19. So as I always say, pedagogy first before technology. And just this morning, I read a wonderful article by Sean Michael Morris where he said, we can plug our students into the virtual learning environment. We can mandate that they turn on their cameras in Zoom. We can re use remote proctoring services, but does that constitute teaching? Does that help us develop a sustainable, equitable digital pedagogy? So that is what faces us now. And so I find it helpful to have the SAMR framework by Dr. Puente, Puente Dura, okay? So so for example, if I used to give it as a lab manual, printed lab manual, but now I send it as a PDF via email, has that fundamentally changed? No. It's only a substitution, right? Uh, it, it's, there's no functional change. But if, for example, I use a crowdsourcing annotation tool like Perus All, so meaning if I sort of like write notes on the side of the PDF, uh, the, the students can see that and react to that. It's like you're having a conversation inside the document. Then maybe that's augmentation. So as teachers, we need to take a look at our tech tools because tech is usually shiny and expensive. But in the end, we have to look at whether does it really modify the learning experience? Does it redefine or is it a mere substitute? Because we live in the Philippines and we are Filipinos, we are high touch. And so we are very stressed by the current environment where we cannot like hold our students or you know be in a face-to-face -face classroom with them. So here you have the quadrants of immediacy and bandwidth. Okay. So we when they said, okay, just make your lecture into a video or a podcast so that can be viewed asynchronously, that's still in the yellow quadrant. 
Okay? What we're having right now, a Zoom webinar uh, that's high immediacy but high bandwidth. So some of you might not have been able to join or, you know, my presentation is choppy <laughs> because of the Wi-Fi. So that's in the red quadrant. So sometimes we're only left with the green quadrant, readings with text and images or email, or maybe the blue quadrant, because if you have Google Drive, you can have Google Docs and you can have collaboration. So we have to situate the ed tech tools that we're going to use in this particular quadrant, knowing the situation and the context of our students. Do they only have low bandwidths? Do they need hand-holding? Therefore, I need high immediacy. So these are the things that we have to assess. So I have made a, a tool, uh, a table that I gave to the UP Manila faculty last March 18. I was trying to attempt you more when I said, you have little expertise, then ano itetch? It requires some expertise, so contech, and then requires tech expertise, so high tech. And please, pag umabot po sa Lintech, uh, to just go and email me already. So in this table, you have the lecturer. So the little expertise may be just email, di ba? An 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 on the slide deck. You have a little contact expertise, maybe you can record the lecture. You can use your mobile phone, record the audio only, okay? Or if you're really high tech, you can try what is on the slide, screencast o matic which is browser-based and free uh, if your video is 15 minutes or less, okay? And then you can share the link on YouTube or via Moodle. But what about the Q&A? If I send them the slides by email, how will they ask their questions? Well, they can also email the questions. But then if you have a large class, diba? don't you sometimes hate those who reply to all in the email and you're not even, uh, you're not even like, interested in what was said, etc. So all the class will see the email. So sometimes it's helpful. Should we just have a Google meeting for those people who have questions? Or I'm asking if you want to check it out, there's an app called Flipgrid. Flipgrid uh, allows students and teachers to, to record short videos on their uh, cell phone. So it will be like, uh, hello, Leslie. Uh, I hope you found the lesson interesting, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll just leave it there. And then when Leslie already has time, she can see what I said. And then she can uh, shoot a short reply also by video. So my millennial students actually love that. So if you have, for example, um, a quiz, so that was a most common question. Well, you can email an open notes exam or you can use the quiz tool. Or here, I invite you to try H5P, which allows you to do a branching scenario quiz. So a branching scenario quiz, if you're my generation, it's like a choose your own adventure book. Uh, if you're the Netflix generation, it's like Bandersnatch where you're watching the movie and you're controlling how the main character will react by choosing some options. So I was thinking maybe we can use it for identifying an unknown microorganism. <laughs> so uh, what does the colony look like? Choose this, this, and then do we do a gram stain? If the gram stain says this, what do we do next, etc. So I think you can apply that in microbiology. So lastly, your course reimagined. Okay, so I think that the microbiology lab class is very um, interesting in how we're going to convert it online. Okay, it's a practical course that needs skills. However, we do not send our students to the lab straight away, right? We do give them some core knowledge. And if you're a lab teacher, it can be repetitive and time consuming. If you have three lab classes, you have to say all those things over and over again three times. So maybe there are certain things that you can put online for them to grapple with already before they come to the class. So as I said, we can save some time if we go on a student rotation. The first um, learning outcome in the MCD1 has to do with the history of microbiology. And I was thinking, uh, is there a TED video about that? And apparently there's this TED video that says, meet the microscopic life in your home and on your face. So I think that would be interesting. And if you go to ed.ted.com lessons, uh, you as a teacher can get that video and then uh, configure a lesson around it. So a TED Ed lesson will have four parts. The watch part, the think, the dig deeper, and discuss. And as you can see there, there's a red button that says customize this lesson. It's free to register. So if I did this, I could like, 
ask questions, multiple choice or open-ended, as you can see, and that appears in the think part. You can ask up, up to 15 questions. Uh, in the dig deeper, if you have some paragraphs in your old syllabus that you wanted to share, uh, those red links are live. So when they click on it, they'll be going to some other place on the internet. So it's more of like um, adding uh, to what is in the video already. And then in the discuss, uh, if you feel like you want to ask more open-ended questions and the students can answer, that's the place where you can do that as well. So you can explore TED-Ed. Uh, you can also use edpuzzle.com. So because it says, make any video your lesson. Choose a video, give it your magic touch, and track your students' comprehension. So uh, instead of them just watching it passively, you can actually do things like insert questions or insert your audio or um, have a note about a certain part of the video. So it's free to use up to 20 videos. Uh, the storage space uh, if you're going to use it and not pay okay uh, so I found this YouTube video in the crash course YouTube channel uh, so crash course history of science and microbiology and if I put that inside Edpuzzle I can actually trim it if you want it to be shorter and then I can do a voiceover I can say oh in this part is going to discuss that however I think etc so you can add your voice to that video or you can ask questions, multiple choice, open-ended, etc. or put a note, okay? And then two weeks ago, when I was given this assignment by Dr. Raymond, I was able to find a virtual microscope, okay? Uh, and it's cool because it actually talks and then it tells you where to go. You can switch views, uh, looking inside, the, I mean, looking at the slide or like this, a macro view, you can see the entire microscope. And I found that there are some teachers who have been using this virtual microscope and they give a handout. And in this handout, they ask the students to write down what they experience as they're manipulating the microscope. Okay, so for example, uh, available on that site, you can look at a chick smear, an onion root tip, and a bacterial capsule. And they ask the students to draw. So that means they really have to go to the virtual microscope site and look at what can be seen there. I found a virtual lab for gram staining. So this one has uh, videos, okay? And then uh, this is the part that I had fun because I could actually sort of manipulate. And you can try this, this is online. When I open the module, it will give me the instructions. So heat fix, etc. And then you have that. And when you use your mouse, you can like get the water, you can get the alcohol, you can turn on the Bunsen burner. And at the very end, you will view the slide so you will know if you were successful or not in doing the gram stain. So I have a short video with no sound. Uh, I try to do it myself. So there, just a description of the gram stain process. And then there's the steps. Then I started. So that's not yet me. So that's still the program. It starts when you see the table already. So he's doing that on his own. Okay. And then there, after this, everything that you see in the screen is me already manipulating my mouse and trying to move stuff. Okay. So use that. So if I don't move the mouse fast enough, the slide is going to stay there for too long. <laughs> and then what do you do next? Crystal violet. Okay. And so I showed this to some friends and they said, oh, that's wrong. You did not flood the slide. You're supposed to flood the slide. But, you know, I can't control how many drops. So maybe if there are tech people uh, listening now, you need to do some sort of a virtual reality thing with this so that it will be more real. Okay. Then the water, okay, we're almost done, right? The alcohol. So they said only like five to 10 seconds, but that uh, the timer didn't appear. So I was worried that it might have been too long. Then the saffron in. And then that's the result. And I was telling people, why are there green stuff? So that means I didn't do the gram stain correctly. Uh, my first attempt, I forgot to hit fix the slide. 
And then when I looked at the slide, there was nothing on it. So I think your students might enjoy this somehow. It's not the real thing, but then it's quite unforgiving. If you don't do something correctly, you're not going to see anything in the slide. Or you're going to see weird stuff, like green things that are not supposed to be there. So that's, I was trying to compare because they said it was supposed to be staff or use uh, and E. coli. And then it said, uh, what happens if you have pitfalls? Okay, so like that happened to me. I forgot to hit fix. So nothing was there on the slide. So in summary, okay, what have we gone through today? Uh, I, I'm in joining you to try flip learning to redesign for inclusivity in this time of the pandemic. Number two, when we redesign our courses, please try to provide a clear path for your students. And lastly, whatever you imagine your course to be, ask for feedback from your students. Some of them will love it, some of them will not, and we have to adjust. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Isip Tan, for the excellent lecture. I am reminding everyone that we will have a designated time for the question and answer portion. So in the meantime, please write your questions for Dr. Isip Tan and, our, and to our subsequent speakers to the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will now proceed to the next lectures, which will provide us blended learning ideas in uh, lecture and laboratory microbiology classes. But as we listen to these two lectures, let us keep in mind what Dr. Isip Tan told us earlier that pedagogy should come first before technology. So our first speaker for the uh, talk on examples of blended learning activities will be Dr. Marilene P. Balolong. Dr. Balolong is a professor of microbiology at the Department of Biology uh, in the University of the Philippines, Manila. She is also a university scientist serving as the Associate Dean for Research and Public Service of the College of Arts and Sciences in UP Manila. She is a diplomate of the Philippine Academy of Microbiology and was trained as a microbiologist in UP Los Baños where she took her BS and MS in microbiology and she obtained the degree in Doctor of Public Health in Medical Microbiology at the College of Public Health in UP Manila. So I will now give the screen to Dr. Marilyn P. Balolong. Good morning, everyone. So uh, let me just first uh, share my screen. Uh, it's already there, no? Is it sharing already? Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, thankful for the Microbiology Consortium for giving us this opportunity to share um, some of our uh, practices no, uh, at the University of the Philippines, Manila, while handling uh, biology 120. No? So um, my assignment would be the teaching microbiology in the lecture part. No? So um, I was actually uh, telling Doc Iris and Mam no? and the, and the organizing team that perhaps for the lecturers or the, those who are teaching the lecture part, um, it's not so difficult transitioning or walang masyadong challenge transitioning from the pre-lockdown 
to the post lockdown no but in a way the the challenge would really be um if you are introducing so many things or so many uh, modifications in teaching uh, microbiology in the classroom or outside will they be interested no <laughs> so uh, let me go on so uh in the lecture part uh we usually teach if this is the Ang una ko muna is share would be the part we're in uh, pre uh, lockdown, no? So the face to face, no? So I'll be I am assigned to 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 talk to you about the topic historical accounts. So ito yung first topic that they will be encountering, no? In uh, in your uh, course in in the basic microbiology and the challenge would be you're opening the door. So, will they be excited to the next topics to come? Or will they be dreaded? <laughs> I will dreaded to uh, please let the semester end. No? So, for the learning outcome of this topic is we need uh, to have them recall no, the important events that led to the development of the science of microbiology and review the contributions made by great scientists. I'm thankful for the... Uh, presentation of Dr. Iris no, ka, a, a while ago, wherein oh, oh, nga, no, we could incorporate also videos uh, in, in introducing this particular topic. So, uh, during the face to face uh, sessions, no, no, nasa classroom kami, we usually have a format uh, like what I'm showing uh, in the slide now. No? So, we have a 30 minutes lecture, so I utilize the PowerPoint. Uh, to uh, uh, to guide me no? uh, to give the lecture and then following that will be an interactive activity. No? So for the formative assessment, normally I'll be providing them historical scientists and then challenge them no? how would these two, for instance Mendel or Robert Koch uh, collaborate? No? What do you think would be the country's problem that they can help solve together through their research. And then they will be pairing up, talk about uh, these things, discuss, etc. And then we will be sharing them in class. And after that, I will have a summative assessment. Now, the summative assessment is, I'm, I'm just checking for the accuracy of the information. So if, if, if it's accurate, I'll give them the whole points and then partial or nothing. The assignment would be search for Philippine microbiologists and their contribution to the country. No? So they'll be developing or making an individual infographic, infographic and then uh, submit that to our Google Classroom or Google Drive. No? So um, in, in this way, uh, I have so many um, uh, parang values that I, I've seen, uh, I have been seeing in this particular uh, plan dito sa topic na to because I did not only introduce no, the historical figures, but instead also introduce the concepts of collaboration. And of course, also let them search no, for microbiologists at home. No, na meron palang microbiologists dito sa Pilipinas. And then what are they doing for the country? So this is during the class time, no, yung, yung face to face pre COVID. No? So uh, here are some of the sample PowerPoint lectures. We, uh, I normally provide them these uh, uh, slide decks prior to class, no? like in a note form, so they can indicate or write some notes in the, in the sheets. No? So uh, they can uh, prepare questions already so that we can meet, if we meet in the class, uh, we, we are ready to discuss their questions. Uh, the strategy for me during the face-to-face -face, uh, class was because uh, normally two meetings a week. So the first meeting would be for the lecture and activity and then the next one is for uh, their personal or you know, independent uh, study providing that uh, summative assessment. So, for, for instance, this is an example of the uh, formative assessment wherein they will pick a pair and then these are the discussion points. No? So, uh, sometimes students would like to work in, in pairs or in groups. They, they enjoy being with their friends no? and uh, they, are, they say they are more confident when they're working with one another uh, rather than uh, individually. 
Okay. Uh, for the summative, before they uh, develop their infographic, infra infographic about the Pinoy microbiologists, I also introduce PSM or the Philippine Society for Microbiology and the Philippine Academy of Microbiology. In this way, they are also introduced that there are societies that are uh, uh, nurturing no, or uh, consists of microbiologists forming the microbiological research, instruction, and public service for the Philippines. So uh, on the other side of the slide will be our sample Google Classroom. I I'm sure uh, some of you are also familiar with this one. And uh, wh what's nice with the Google Classroom is they can see how uh, they they turn no na manong manakwa nilang points and then uh, I get to keep no the materials on hand so if the student for instance would say nag submit naman ako ma'am uh, and then uh, when I check but it's gonna be uh, ma ma time stamp niya to and then it will indicate they're inflate or not no so so maganda siyang record keeping so that you will not have all the materials lost no kapag grading season na so uh, quite nice because of course they acknowledge no. Uh, sabi ko nga kay Ma'am Sean, Ma'am Sean, kayo lagi yung blockbuster hit na example, no, and uh, Dr. Cabrera, no. But but it's it's pretty exciting that uh, more and more uh, they are already citing yung mga scientists natin na that are younger, for instance si Dr. Pai, mga ganyan, no. And they are they note no the contributions of these particular scientists. So these are just some examples of the infographics that they have submitted. So how did I adjust for the Locked, uh, during the lockdown, no? Kasi parang from a blended, flexible online, it suddenly became remote. So sabi ko nga, no, honestly, hindi naman ganun talaga ka-challenging. I think mas challenging for the laboratory instructors. No? I was talking to uh, our laboratory instructors, Sir Joel and Sir EJ. Sabi ko, paano yun? We're checking skills here. So how would we do that? So it's really challenging for the lab. But I think uh, Daniel Ra later would be uh, sharing uh, his experiences about the laboratory. So for the lecture, as I have said, uh, minimal adjustments were done. But of course, we have to really um, uh, consider no, that when working at home, there are so many things no, um, bombarding the minds or the yung kanilang attention ng mga estudyante sa bahay. No? So, kailangan din natin uh, mag-keep up. No? So, for the lecture, uh, I started to use podcast. So, ito yung i-video, uh, no, i-record mo yung lecture mo, voice lang or video cast na meron kang face doon or screen cast when your powerpoint has your cutie face on the side no so but this to be depending on your bandwidth limitations so like for instance last semester i have 24 students and every time i would throw a particular uh, activity there are three students na hindi nakaka keep up no and that is because of their bandwidth limitations so for us the podcast and the PowerPoint works, no? So uh, we shared uh, those files via our group chat or Google Drive access or links sent to emails or FB chat. Perhaps the decision factor here would be the security of your files, no? So kayo na yung decide na how secure would your files be when you put it in these particular uh, drives, no? So for the activity rin, uh, we tried the Zoom breakout rooms. So para, para silang naka sa classroom, di ba, mag, mag move sila ng mga chairs and then they would be uh, talking into small circles. So dito sa Zoom breakout rooms, parang ganun din, no? So uh, of course, we continue to utilize the Google Classroom and the G Drive submissions to, for more organized uh, submissions. What are the challenges? Um, actually, for the challenges, uh, how, how can we continue to motivate students to remain active and not passive when they are actually having the lessons at home? No? So what I did, para, ito, this is just an, uh, what I do para, to pacify my worry or anxiety. No? So I, I asked them, so if you would, uh, if you would uh, check on this, no? again, the three students, may three students ako na hindi nakasagot sa survey because they don't have access to the internet. So what we did is just to ask them via SMS. So, tinanong ko sila, say, uh, 
for pre-recorded or post-recorded lectures uh, and as a, uh, how would how would you how would you like that to be posted or where do you like to have them posted no so or or kasi we are initially using discord uh, discord is uh, very easy to access low bandwidth lang yung kailangan niya however we we fear for the security no kasi baka mamaya yung mga files namin would be you know uh, lurked on. So, tinanong ko sila, if you wouldn't be using Discord, what do you think would be okay? So, so they choose Zoom and we are grateful that uh, UP provided us for an only Zoom time. So, kaya, kumbaga, makakapag-discuss kami unlimited and hanggat ka, hanggat gusto nila. So, for the online modes, uh, they would prefer a blend of asynchronous and synchronous. Kasi sa, uh, when the semester was off or cut off early for UP, some of them uh, really requested na, ma'am, uh, can we uh, secretly, <laughs> can we secretly have uh, a meetup, an online meetup just to talk about COVID-19, etc., etc. No? So they would, they would still like, you, uh, to meet you as a teacher and talk about what they want to say and it's very exciting to listen to them no so for the pre-recorded no they would like to have a screen recording with audio so uh as teachers how can we effectively guide students to learning uh as previously mentioned by dr iris we we also have to ha to do our assignment as a teacher uh, right now we are pressured to uh try new platforms such as Canvas no, at UP Manila. So at UP Manila, uh, we, we are now being trained no, uh, through various online workshops about Canvas. Uh, it thrills me because it's, it's not so difficult to uh, maneuver, no? uh, being a, a person that is not so techy. No? <laughs> Kasi talagang pag, pag medyo teki na yan, medyo nag na yung, yung aking shell, no? But but it's it's kind of exciting. But I'm still not an expert though. I'm still learning, no? So I have like two months to really learn uh, Canvas, no? So what we did previously, yung mga na-try na ko na, is the uh, Mentimeter. I'm sure most of you also have heard about the Mentimeter. The kids love mentimeter na no? so um gustong gusto nila yung kasali sila during your discussion without raising their hand or talking or telling no yung parang anonymity ba kasi uh, most of them are really shy when you call them during recitation so in mentimeter you are engaging them into participating and yet nawawala yung shyness no and also we we tried a virtual laboratories so for the Mentimeter, for instance, this is a topic on microbial growth. So uh, uh, I will just sh sh uh, tell them to, okay, uh, go to menti.com and use that code and then answer your question. So the, you can embed this particular slide uh, onto your current PowerPoint slide. So when you click it, it will show the results already. So yung mga may kulay na yan, yan yung mga sagot nila. So you can you can choose an array of how the answers would look like. So parang ganyan. So for instance, ito yung una kong tanong and then I followed it up with ito kasi is ano yung makakain mo sa fridge for your daily growth. And then the other one is for the microorganisms naman, what do you think your fridge has to offer for them, no? So I I tried a different uh, way to present their answers para hindi boring, no? So uh, dito they could they could be themselves no they can answer in any language they want and uh, not sh not being shy at all. Another one is on ma metagenomics no so not all of them are very familiar with the word microbiome so before I introduced it to them I asked them this menti question and the uh, lahat po ng colorful uh, terms jan or words that they type eh, si gawa ng estudyante no and and it's it's really funny because sometimes alam niyo yung mga uh, sa classroom na nanjo joke na lang or wala nang masabing matino nandiyan pa rin kung makikita nyo dun sa medyo baba may nakalagay na i love you ma'am is small yan yung mga ganyan na. so so uh, we 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 have to uh, I have been observing that through this, they are being um, more relaxed, no, and uh, hindi masyadong stiff, kagaya nung normal, uh, normal recitation. 
And then when I also ask them, no, you can have, uh, have a multiple choice kind of uh, menti question and then uh, present to them this one. So my question here, is, oh, sorry, my question here is that uh, if we are going to do metagenomics, because this is a question after I showed them the workflow in a metagenomic research uh, to study microbial diversity, alin ka dyan? Ikaw ba yung wet lab biologist? Are you the dry lab biologist? Yun and then, of course, there are two, <laughs> there, is, uh, there are two students na undecided. No? But, but it, it's really cool no, that uh, they, they also are thinking about how their skills would match the the particular work no of a dry lab or a wet lab biologist when you are studying microbial diversity through metagenomic analysis so another challenge would be the resources no so of course who have many resources to share who would be needing them no so for for me personally we access uh, publicly available materials because during the lockdown, parang we were so surprised. Okay, mag, mag online ano ka, but but you, you don't have anything yet prepared. No, uh, I don't have yet a video, I don't have uh, uh, something like this to share, etc. So that was an opportunity to really check the internet and look for possible uh, support no, uh, for available materials. And you'll be surprised, there are so many. Of course, some of them have fees, yung mga may bayad, yung mga iba naman are very generous to share them. So it, it, it's really nice, no? uh, it's really an, uh, a good thing. So, but of course, the more important thing is we must learn how to cite them properly. Sabi nga ni Dr. Iris kanina, no? We need to check whether is it okay to share, is it okay to modify, etc. Okay? Of course, uh, the shared resources would be most benefiting, you know, speaking from, from a teacher's point of view. But of course, we have to check about the IPR. But I think slowly, you'll be getting there. So those are my experiences for the lecture part. And again, I thank you, the uh, MCC or the Microbiology Consortium, for this opportunity to share the experience. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balolong. We will now proceed to our next speaker. The next speaker is Mr. John Daniel Ong, and he will talk about blended learning in a microbiology laboratory class. He is an assistant professor at the Microbiology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He finished his bachelor's degree in biology, majoring in microbiology, as well as his master's degree in microbiology, minoring in molecular biology and biotechnology at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. He is a specialist microbiologist and a proud member of the Phi Sigma Honor Society and the Philippine Society for Microbiology. Daniel? The screen is now yours. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Les and Masha, for that introduction and also for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to share with you my um, thoughts on uh, flexible and blended learning when it comes to the microbiology laboratory. As was mentioned by um, Dr. Balolo, there is a very challenging, um, it's very challenging for the microbiology lab to shift from the conventional lab setting to now the remote learning. And it's our uh, challenge as educators of microbiology to be able to still share with our students the knowledge that they need as well as to impart the skills that they have to acquire in order to um, uh, proceed with their uh, studies and eventually their careers as microbiologists. So just to share with you um, a brief 
introduction. So before the COVID-19 outbreak, this is the class setting. And as you can see, so he, this is the conventional class setting and we are studying, um, the students have a lab manual, for example, for a particular course, say MCB1, now is MCB11, which is biology and applications of microorganisms. So they are given a schedule of activities for the entire semester and they are expected to read the exercise scheduled for that particular day before coming to class. And once they arrive in class, what I usually do is to give a pre-lab quiz in order to make sure whether they've read the exercise for the day. And after that, we proceed with the pre-lab discussion. Now the pre-lab discussion, of course, would include the objectives, the background of the exercise, and the laboratory proper. After that, we proceed with the lab work once the pre-lab discussion is um, done. Now, here we, uh, in the left hand the picture, so this is our um, actual picture of my class, wherein we're having the pre-lab quiz before the pre-lab discussion. And at the right hand uh, side, you see here the actual performance of the uh, exercise. Specifically, this is a uh, gram, staining, gram staining exercise. So for the conventional means for assessing the learning of our students, we have this uh, lab exercise sheet, which is attached to the lab manual. And they are to answer it during and after the experiment proper. So while observing the, uh, while observing the microorganisms, in the microscope, they are to draw these organisms that they see. They will put the specific magnification and their corresponding uh, descriptions. And for the quizzes, pre-lab and post-lab quizzes, we usually use this. I'm sure um, most from the University of the Philippine system would be familiar with this, the blue book. So this is what we use as um, means to monitor their quizzes. and. Yeah, so these are the two means, conventional means for assessing the students in the laboratory. Of course, uh, besides these two, you also have the lab exams, written lab exams, and of course, the uh, techniques exam, which will be uh, given at the end of the course. Now, going to the remote learning. So in remote learning, as was mentioned earlier, by uh, Dr. Tan and also Dr. Belolo, we have these learning management systems that we could use. Personally, I've been using Edmodo uh, for about, I think, three years now. And uh, I find this very useful. Uh, later, I'll show you uh, some uh, things that you could do with Edmodo. Then you also have Google Classroom, which was shown also by Dr. Belolo. And the Canvas was also mentioned. And this was also uh, introduced to me by uh, uh, UP Manila's uh, seminar or training rather on uh, biosafety and uh, biosecurity. So if you've attended that, they use the Canvas um, learning management system. It's actually very good and I'm still currently learning it and I think it's a very good platform wherein our students could uh, really learn and as well as interact with us during classes. And also we have, of course, Moodle. Now, to replace the pre-lab discussion, we will be, uh, we can, what we could do is a PowerPoint with voiceover and embedded videos. So later I will be showing you an example of the PowerPoint and some of the videos that uh, the microbiology division prepared uh, in, even before, even before the uh, pandemic, we already had this video prepared for our students to be able to clearly visualize the techniques in the laboratory before actually performing it. So, so this would be a PowerPoint voiceover and videos. And this is what I was telling you about uh, in Moodle, the learning management system that uh, I'm using. So you could put here your quizzes as a form of assessment. So you put the quiz title, say for example, exercise three um, quiz on uh, staining of microorganisms, so you have your instructions. And then the quiz questions can be in the form of two or false, multiple choice, and 
you have many different um, things that you could work on, whether you want it matching type or fill in the blanks or multiple answer type of questions. Now for the assignment, you could also uh, schedule an assignment here in Edmodo. Assignment or a project which they could uh, submit. And uh, for example, you want to submit them to submit it a week after so you could schedule it uh, say next week uh, Thursday this particular time and then once the student or if the student fails to submit it then magkaklose na po yung submission so meron siyang specific time lang kung kailan ka magsasubmit so you'll be uh, sure that the students uh, whether the student is capable of, or is able to submit your requirement on time. Kasi hindi na po nila pwedeng submit yun once the submission closes. So just to summarize, con conventional versus the remote. So pre-lab discussion and pre-lab quiz po, yung sa in-class. While for the remote, yung pre-lab discussion would be yung PowerPoint with voiceover na po. As was mentioned by Dr. Tan, you have the asynchronous and synchronous. So in this case, this would be asynchronous. So, pwede po siyang ibigay beforehand so that the student would be able to uh, read and listen to the lecture. So, maganda nga po yung sinabi kanina na it should have, uh, it should not be just a PowerPoint or a PDF uh, file of your PowerPoint. Rather, it should have the text na para ka talaga nagle-lecture or pwede ka mag-voice over doon. Then, for number two, so, sa in-class setting, you have the demo. So the professor would demonstrate first the technique that uh, that will be done in the laboratory and hands-on laboratory performance of the students. Now, in, to replace that, we could use a demo video, which we already uh, have. Later, I will be showing you that video. And um, the student could also, nandito na po sa baba, a demo video of the student performing the lab technique. So later po, pwede kong, uh, papakita ko lang po yung instruction as to uh, how we could um, give the student this type of uh, project or assignment. Then number three, for conventional, we have the exercise sheets for the remote. Pwede pa rin naman pong gamamit ng exercise sheets and they will just have to upload it in a platform, say for example, Edmodo. So pwede pong i-upload yun in PDF file. So yan po yung uh, kapalit po ng mismong paper the exercise sheet that they have. Then for the conventional class setting, you have the post-lab quiz and discussion as well. Well, for the remote, of course, you have the online time quizzes and the post-lab discussion via the PowerPoint with voiceover as well, and then other requirements. Later, I'll be showing you some of the assessment tools that you can use in the laboratory. So for example, here you have the exercise that I will be showing you, staining microorganisms for microscopic examination. So this is from the laboratory manual. It's being used in MCB 11 in our division, so in UPLB. Over here, it's just being, this is a bit pre-lab discussion that I was showing you. Wala po itong voiceover, but you could use uh, the voiceover um, uh, function in PowerPoint. Madali lang naman po yun agamitin. So for example, here we have uh, in the previous exercise, exercise two, we were studying microorganisms in their natural state. And pwede kong tanongin sila, ano, ano nga ba yung naging problema natin dun sa uh, pag-observe ng microorganisms in the natural state. Then, as was mentioned by Dr. Tan, pwede pong maglagay tayo dito ng question using Edpuzzle. So, isa po yung na-mention kanina ni uh, Dr. Tan. Maglalagay po tayo ng question dyan, what's the problem with uh, observing microorganisms in their natural state. And to alleviate this problem, we gagamit po tayo ng stains. Now, what are the different kinds of stains? So, pwede po discuss yan, acidic dye. So, these are negatively charged dye used to stain the background. Therefore, the cells would be unstained and luminous. And examples of these acidic dyes are the following. Then basic dyes are cationic, so used to directly stain the microorganism, and these are the examples. Now, what are the different types of, or the different steps rather, in staining? So first, you have smear preparation. 
and later uh, we'll be showing you a uh, I'll be showing you a video of smear preparation that was prepared uh, in our laboratory. So ito po yung smear preparation for you to clearly visualize it. So this video does not have a um, does not have a voiceover yet, but uh, it's it's easily uh, you can easily add an audio to it. So here you get the water, and then put it on the slide. So this video was made in our laboratory. So hindi po to galing sa YouTube, although you could also use videos from the uh, from YouTube. Uh, although this would be the uh, the usual equipment that we use in the lab. So you have an alcohol lab, and then you have the uh, wire loop. So you flame it till red hot, and then after that, why are you flaming? Pwede pong habang nagdi-discuss, ginagawa ko po sa klase yun na uh, asking them why do you need to flame it till red hot, what would happen if you don't flame it till red hot, etc. So again, you could use also Edpuzzle to edit the video to add some questions. So after that, so sabi niya po natin, nalagay na po yung smear dun sa slide. After that would be fixation. So also another video after discussing it. So once the smear is prepared, so air drive na po, the fixation would happen so by passing through the flame about three times. You have to remember what happens if you don't heat fix it. So yung na-mention po kanina dun si ni Dr. Tan in the um, site that, he, that she uh, shown, uh, kapag hindi po na-heat fix, wala po makikita sa microscope. So maganda po yun. I also... I uh, tried using that particular uh, site. Maganda nga po siya and I think the students would also um, like it. Mamaya po may ipapakita rin ako na isa pang uh, gram stain na site, sort of a game, wherein the student could also uh, yeah, do gram staining and pwede rin pong tingnan kung uh, may mali ba dun sa specific game na yon at bakit. So in staining for gram staining, we also prepare a video of gram staining. So here we have uh, first this crystal violet. So pinapakita ko muna yung mga stains na ginagamit. So this video was taken by uh, Dr. Leonard Hamora, a professor also in our division. So, pwede nyo rin pong gawin ito sa laboratory ninyo. So, we may one minute. So, sa phone na lang po. Pwede po kayong, kayo pong bahala how you would be doing your video. So, that's for the crystal violet. And after crystal violet, will be iodine. So, first, you have to wash it. You should not wash it directly above the smear. Because if you do that, then, of course, it would be, the smear would be washed off. Or the specimen would be washed off. So after washing, then you add the iodine. So how about we discuss the question? What is the function of iodine? So iodine would be, I would serve as a more than it would form a complex with your CV or the ACVI complex. So we can discuss it in the video. So again, it could be uh, synchronous if it's possible to uh, Zoom, we discuss this method ng live, or we can also uploaded the video with uh, this video with uh, audio voice uh, voiceover and ethanol pare pareho lang lang po diretso ko na lang po ngayon so that we uh, proceed with the uh, example for assessment so then after that blood drying so just to summarize grab staining so we have your smear preparation 
So, pwede rin po kayong gumawa ng animated lang din po para mas makita lang nila. Then, air drying and then heat fixation. So, for the assessment tools that you could use in the laboratory, so, ito po yung isang pwede yung ilagay ninyo dun sa inyong slide. Should you have any questions or clarifications, kindly post them in the comment section of my post in the Edmodo group. So, for example, magpo-post po ko sa Edmodo group nitong exercise 3 staining microorganisms from, uh, for microscopic examination. So, they would be uh, commenting their, their, uh, their questions and um, I would be answering them. And the students or their classmates can also uh, answer if ever they have something to share. Or, yung sinabi po kanina ni uh, Dr. Tan regarding synchronous, na pwede pong magkaroon ng online consultation via Zoom. For example, online consultation via Zoom next week, Thursday, 10 to 11 a.m. So, of course, uh, hindi po lahat makaka-attend dyan. Some would have no internet connection. So, pwede naman silang mag-post dun sa comment section. Kapag kunwari, uh, once a week lang sila nakakapag-load for the internet, for example, or yeah, so something like that. Then for the exercise, so pwede meron kayong lab uh, exercise sheet pa din, but of course, the lab exercise sheet should be modified to uh, accommodate yung remote learning. So yung ating pong currently lab exercise ngayon would be modified uh, into a different, a similar but uh, different lab exercise that would accommodate uh, remote learning. So this would be uploaded in the Edmodo group and then also there's a quiz that they have to uh, answer. Ito po yung isang ipapakita ko, mabilis lang. Um, isang assignment po na pwedeng ibigay natin would be to play this game. So this link, uh, is, the, is the staining method done correctly and then why? So they can uh, submit their answer to the Edmodo group. So just to show you, Mabilis lang po. Uh, sorry. Hmm. So, so Kailangan po siyempre medyo mabilis yung uh, internet connection. Nakikita niyo po ngayon yung Gram Staining Virtual Lab. Ayan. So, forward ko lang po. So, meron yogurt section daw to ng dairy processing plant. And then, they want to check whether the yogurt has gone bad or not. So, you plain and this is what plain good yogurt looks like. And notice the uniform texture and color. Then, this is what bad yogurt looks like. And then, collect the samples for gram staining. So bacteria that stain pink or reddish means that the yogurt is contaminated because what we should be looking at or what we should see is or are gram positive uh, bacteria. So in prepare in their preparation, so ito po, so pwede pong strike mismo to, gagamitin niya po itong striker, drag po ito, so live po yung ginagawa ko ngayon, and then after that, you draw a circle on the slide. So ikaw po mismo yung magdodraw dyan. So asensya na po kayo sa drawing ko. Then you could, of course, import. It's important to label it. Say milk, sample, one. Asensya na po sa handwriting. Mahira po. Ayan. So we need to delete the yogurt before putting it on the microscope slide. So, start by placing 1 ml of the diluent. So, dito makikita nyo ano po ba yung kulang or may mali po ba dun sa mismo method. Then, you have the inoculation loop which you can flame to the red hot. Then, you will get the sample after pulling it down. Dilute it. Then, you can shake it. Then after that, you have to transfer. Then get the sample, another one. Then you spread it. 
Like after drying, of course, you have to heat fix. So medyo similar lang din po sa pinakita kanina ni Dr. Uh, Tan. So here would be the crab staining. So lalagay po dyan, crystal violet. And then after that, we are to wait for one minute. And then, kailangan pong i-rinse. So ano po yung mali dito? Siyempre, kapag ganyan po kalakas yung tubig, and directly above the smear, wala na po yung sample natin. So our students should be able to uh, notice to that, especially when it's discussed in the pre-lab discussion. So after that, it will be one minute. So then, rinse. The next po, alcohol. Rinse. After that would be the saffron. So, ganyan po yung isa sa uh, pwedeng ipakita natin, ipagawa natin sa ating students uh, in repl to replace rather yung kanilang in-lab na performance or lab performance po nila of gram staining at the very least. So, flat drying kasama po. So after that, ayan, pwede po nilang gawin at the end, malalakad din nila kung nagawa nila ng tama. So pag mag, pwede po silang maglagay dito, sila po yung mismo maglalagay ng time. So 60 seconds and so on. So bali yan po yung gram staining. So, balik na po tayo din sa mismo. Ayan. So, pwede po nilang i-check whether the staining method is done correctly and they could submit it to the Edmodo group. And lastly, for the demo video, for us to be able to check whether they can actually do the staining itself, medyo challenging po ito and kailangan pong specify din natin kung ano yung pwede nilang magamit sa bahay kasi baka mamaya gumamit po sila ng uh, hazardous material or masugatan pa sila sa paggawa ng video. So, pwede natin specify na kung ano po yung pwede nilang magamit. So, they could, you could specify, you could use a stick without a sharp tip, for example, as war loop, empty container, as test tube, etc. So, yan po yung posibleng um, gamitin for us to be able to check whether our students are capable of doing gram staining or not. So, pwede rin po mag-label sila ng mga containers na this is um, crystal violet, this is iodine, etc. So just to acknowledge, so my division from UPLB, I thank um, the division for their support as well as um, their help during the preparation of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John Daniel Ong, for that very interesting uh, talk about uh, blended learning activities in uh, microbiology laboratory class. Um, uh, we will now proceed to the open forum. Again, if you have questions, please type them uh, in the Q&A box, which can be found uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We already have a few questions. So I think the first question can be answered by our Microbiology Consortium Committee Chair, Academician Raimundo. The first okay. question is from Dr. Lynn Esther Ralios. Uh, she is asking if it is possible for the consortium to work together in the next few months to come up with one instructional program for general microbiology for the first semester. Hi, Erlene. Yes, actually, that's the, uh, the plan. But we have to do something about it. We have to gather the different heads of the different HI members and see how they can, everybody can cooperate. But that is actually the plan of the consortium, uh, the common educational portal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raimundo. 
For the next question, uh, I think this can be addressed by our three speakers. So um, actually it's a comment, but we can have our speaker share their thoughts about this. Uh, from uh, Ms. Imelda Romero, uh, we can also design improvised experiments with materials readily available at home where our students are, so they will be able to experience and see by themselves the actual results of the experiments. What are your thoughts uh, on this? So any one of our speakers can uh, give their response to the question. Uh, sige po, mauna na po kung nasiguro ako. Uh, Na-mention ko po kanina rin na, uh, yeah, one of the possible means for assessing the learning of the student would be to have an actual video of them doing a specific experiment. So uh, I agree with um, what was said by, I'm sorry, sino nga po ulit yung... Anyway, what was said, uh, I agree with uh, using materials that are available at home. Say for example, kung ano po yung like simple stick or kung kagamit sila ng empty containers that will serve as test tubes, tapos maglalagay lang po doon ng uh, liquid, tapos magdidilute sila for example. So uh, maybe they could uh, do that, tapos magbibideo po and then they could upload that as, uh, they could share that actually to the class. Dr. Balolong, do you have uh, other thoughts regarding the comment? Actually, there are some uh, websites that are uh, suggesting, no? uh, but these are mostly mga for K to 12. Ano? So perhaps we could level up the, the particular suggestions of those websites on, on uh, the level of the learning outcomes that we can do. Like, halimbawa, meron sila may examples na uh, how to reconstruct the bacterial cell, yung mga ganyan, using household materials, and ganyan. So, so if, if, it's, if the level of the instructions is for K to 12, perhaps we can measure, uh, measure up. No? So, may mga suggestions din doon ng mga materials that are readily available at home. So, if we are going to design our course, for instance, to that particular topic, maybe we can modify through that. At least may starting material tayo. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think a related question to that is uh, the one from Mr. Ronil Campanero. He is asking for suggestions for students who have limited lab resources at home. So, any thoughts from our uh, speakers? Uh, I was uh, actually uh, looking for home lab kits, uh, and I found that there are companies abroad that offer them, uh, but they're quite expensive. So, the lab kit would actually include the microscope, for example, the slides, and some of the things. Uh, to get started with microbiology. Um, but maybe someone can design a low-cost alternative uh, to be able to do these. So like, uh, is, is it possible to make those agar plates or something? Uh, how do we store them, etc.? cetera? Uh, I'm sure someone will be able to come up with a, uh, a bright idea on how this can be made low-cost. Thank you, Dr. Iris. Um, Another question is about assessment from uh, Mr. Joval Martinez. Okay, so the question goes, I am worried about the assessment of students skill-wise, especially in the lab. What do you think are the possible alternative skill assessment method that may be used? Um, having done the exercise I showed you yesterday, uh, it suffers from like dexterity because it's usually just mouse movements to move the like the wire loop, etc. Uh, I happen to be on the UP system committee on remote learning, and some of the discussions we've had is that we need to partner with uh, the people in engineering to actually uh, come up with a virtual reality uh, <laughs> experience where it will feel like they're actually holding the 
the wire loop, for example. Uh, however, you know, we only have two months. <laughs> so um, I guess we, we have to, like, sort of, like I said, uh, make some sort of a lab kit and have them video themselves. Um, the other thing I said that we, we tried before is to have a video that shows wrong things and ask them to identify what the wrong things are. But again, that's more cognitive. It's not like, you know, using your hands. So we really have to figure out how to do that. Another question re related to virtual laboratory from James Paul Madigal. Um, I would like to ask if those virtual lab, I think the virtual lab uh, example shown in the lecture, if they are accessible and if they are free. So, yes. Uh, uh, the virtual labs are free. The uh, virtual lab shown by Dr. Tan as well as the virtual lab that I showed. Uh, both are free, so pwede pong ibigay nyo lang yung link, and then they could access it anywhere as long as they have the internet. Last? Last. Yes. Uh, Dr. Raimundo, yes, please. The Microbiology Consortium will come up with a link wherein most of the, uh, many of the uh, resources will be all be there. So just one link and everything that we can gather will be there. So others have already some links or some materials can also share in that link so that we can expand the scope of our uh, portal. Thank you, Dr. Raimundo. Uh, a follow-up question from uh, James Madigal. Uh, how will we assess the skill or lab performance of our students, particularly in the micro laboratory class? Daniel. <laughs> so, far po kasi, um, Sir James, ay yung kung means for assessing the skills like dexterity po, ang nakikita ko pa lang po so far as of now would be to make the homemade na video of themselves doing the technique itself using alternative uh, materials. Say for example, kung niya, meron po silang mga empty containers, etc. But other than that, currently, maganda po yung suggestion actually ni Dr. Tana, if someone could develop uh, a lab kit, a low-cost lab kit, if for example, meron pong may plastic or glass na mumurahin lang na may tubes, isang bilihan na, may box na, may tubes na, may plates na, etc. So, pwede po siguro isang project yun. Thank you, Daniel. We have a question from an anonymous attendee. How can we avoid cheating by the students during exams, during virtual or online classes? Okay, so that was uh, something I was asked a lot uh, during uh, the last few months. Uh, right now, I know of someone who puts the quiz on the learning management system, uh, and then the browser has a, a exam safe browser, which means that uh, she cannot, the student cannot uh, open any other tabs in that browser while doing the test. Uh, and then some people are doing e proctoring. Uh, so, like here on Zoom, I think the maximum number, if you look at the, all the participants, but in that um, gallery view, I think there will be like 25 people all in the squares. <laughs> uh, so they're asking the students to be in the Zoom meeting while taking the quiz <laughs> on the learning management system and someone is watching all those squares <laughs> uh, so that they cannot get up, they cannot go anywhere else, etc. So it's really intrusive. Uh, I worry that the students don't feel comfortable because you can see like the inside of the rooms, etc. It's a privacy concern. Uh, but then uh, that's how far we might need to go if you really want to make sure. And my suggestion is, how can we make it uh, more flexible that we're still able to assess without it having to be that uh, hard? Uh, we need to be more creative <laughs> on how to do those assessments. Thank you, Dr. Isip Tan. A related question to that is the use of rubrics for the evaluation, especially in the lab. So would rubrics do in a laboratory skills evaluation? 
Um, sige po. Uh, I think um, isa pong pwede natin gawin. Currently, we have the uh, lab performance as part of the grading system in our laboratories. So, uh, for example, if it's 15% uh, laboratory performance, we have to change that into a, a project, for example, like the demo video, where in the demo video would have a specific rubric. Say, for example, 50% content and then 20% or 25% accuracy, etc. So, mga ganun po yung pwedeng gawin natin. Uh, when I make rubrics, uh, they're not necessarily percentage. So, what I use would be like acceptable, uh, for example, acceptable holding of the wire loop, uh, not so acceptable, and then exceed these expectations. So, like, uh, try to do the gram stain again after so many years. So you could say like, uh, did not flood the slide. So, mm -hmm. but he still, you know, put something there. So it's not necessarily wrong. Uh, so there's gradations of only put a little, flooded the slide, forgot this. Uh, that can be put in a rubric. Thank you, Dr. Hey, sure. Dan. Yes. Sure. Um, Share ko lang din po. Yung pong, meron po kami actually ginagamit na rubrics for the techniques exam. Similar to what uh, Dr. Uh, Tan said na uh, in, in the techniques exam, nakalagay po doon may points for proper lab attire din. So, uh, kung sinake po ba yung test tube or not, or kung, eh, kung aseptic po ba, kung nag-disinfect ba. So, mayroon pong specific points yun doon sa techniques exam. Na-remind po ako doon sa sinabi po ni Dr. Dan. Thank you po. Okay. So, how about practical exams? Uh, is there a mechanism you can share uh, for the conduct of practical exams if we will have remote learning? There's a question about that. So anyone from our... Uh, uh, I think this could be a return demo. So, is a return yeah. demo possible in remote learning? Um, that, that is quite a very challenging um, um, activity for now. No? Ngayon yung nasa lockdown, para ang hirap niyang isipin. Ano? But I think we could, uh, like say, perhaps plan uh, more accurately kapag medyo nakalaya na tayo ng konti. No? But for me, my opinion is that uh, uh, there may be a possibility that, for instance, if in preparation for a practical exam, so uh, meron, meron pwedeng ipa-uwing ipa set. No? Uh, like for instance, so ito yung tubes, ito yung alcohol lamp, ito yung mga kakailanganin, no? flask, plates, etc. They may not necessarily contain anything, pero kung like halimbawa sa practical exams namin, an aseptic technique, pouring, ganyan, uh, may mga set of points lang na kailangan mo makita, just like uh, what Daniel mentioned. No? And then, pwede tayong, okay, Zoom, now you have your kit, you can open your kit, let's, let's start. No? So this is your scenario, okay? So can you show me how to say, for media you know, in plates, parang ganon. So, so tell me, ano yung mga hindi mo pwedeng i-act, i-act, no? Uh, and then, uh, ipakita mo sa akin yung pwede mong i-act using that particular kit. So, sa ngayon, since wala pa tayong access sa school, pwede yung mga points lang muna sasabihin. Pero kung meron na tayong access sa school, I, I, I was, I'm thinking along that line that perhaps they could bring home some materials that can be possibly used for that. Thank you, Dr. Balolong. There's also a very relevant question posted by uh, Ronnie Kalugay. So any, I think any one of our speakers can answer this question as well as Dr. Raimundo. What kind of topics do you suggest for thesis students now that it is risky to go out and do wet lab? This is quite challenging for both undergrad and grad thesis students. Uh, can I answer, Ma'am Les, before Ma'am Sean? <laughs> so, so uh, actually, I, I'm going to share the experience of, of our fourth year students na biglang na apektohan ng lockdown. No? So, nagkukonduct sila ng thesis halfway 
uh, they are doing all the wet lab and then suddenly lockdown, they cannot access the lab. So there are some objectives yet na hindi pa nila na natutupad or na nakocomply using experiments. So what the thesis committee recommended is that perhaps we could uh, modify the objectives. So what we did for for the students is we tried bioinformatics. No, uh, we tried bioinformatics in the sense of how it would play along with the current objectives of the of their study. Na hindi mababago or hindi masisira yung original plan nila. So, uh, kunwari yung isang, um, yung isang pair ko, no? so, ang kailangan nilang, nilang experiment is to conduct the 96 well plate uh, NO assay. No? So, sabi ko, kung mawawala yan, ano yung pwedeng isubstitute para masabi mo na may NO uh, capability of producing na nitrogen na nitrous oxide uh, capability yung organism mo. So they tried studying the genome and check for the gene na anong nag may nag induce ba para magproduce sa kanya ng NO, etc. So nung napalabas nila yon, then nasagot nila yung objective kahit hindi pa. No? But of course, when they discussed it, nandun pa rin sa recommendation yung uh, they have to confirm that particular uh, information using uh, wet lab later on, parang ganon. So, bioinformatics for microbiology can be a very good substitute uh, for that. Kung talagang may hirapan lumabas uh, sa field or to explore uh, people, uh, interviews, mga ganyan, or to access the lab. I think it worked well for my experience. Yes. yes, Dr. Raimundo. Yeah, that's really a very challenging situation. But as uh, uh, I agree with Len, we can have bioinformatics for the first uh, first part. I mean, if it's a new junior, so the first year maybe uh, bioinformatics and other theoretical uh, situation about his or her problem. But I hope that before they step out of the university, they will be given a chance to do dry lab, a uh, wet lab, because otherwise yeah. they'll be lost in the world of microbiologists if they get yeah. out of the university without uh, having experience a wet lab yes. in, uh, in solving problems in microbiology. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Raimundo. Uh, we have another question related to exams, uh, because I think this is a, uh, uh, a big issue with doing remote learning uh, assessment and the giving of exams. From Benjamin Hularbal, how can we as address the limited internet connection of students, especially during online microbio exams and submission of requirements? Can, can I answer less? I, I would like to share the, the really nightmarish <laughs> uh, experience experience that I had this lockdown, no? uh, I still have to have one exam just to have, uh, just to evaluate my students para mag magkaroon ba sila ng past grade or numeric grade. No? It was really challenging because if you would remember, I mentioned kanina, meron akong tatlong bata na walang online. No? So uh, sabi ko, paano ba ito? So I have, I, I prepared 30 sets of exam. So, hindi naman siya multiple choice. So, uh, hindi naman siya ganun. But I challenge them uh, to a certain set of parang uh, layout questions. So, sabi ko sa kanila, uh, isip kayo ng disease na gusto nyong aralin and then, tatanungin ko kayo based on the learning outcomes of the syllabus. So, so parang ang nangyari is I have 20 plus students I have 20 plus or more set of questions on Hanal. Phone call. As in one hour per student. So, nag nagkakwentuhan kami, etc. with all the questions. Pero ang, ang ano doon is, naisisingit ko pa rin yung gram stain, naisisingit ko pa rin yung mga kailangan nilang matutunan, pero isang disease lang yung inaral niya. And nakomprehend nila. And doon ko sila, meron akong mga how to grade them. Uh, with those particular, and we have agreed on na uh, okay lang ba yung pag-grade sa inyo ng ganyan so that they would also know, how would I really study for my disease? No? Uh, so, doon sila nakatutok sa 
kapag umalis ako ng Bio 120 or ng microbiology, ito dapat yung alam ko. So, that way nila inaral yon And I'm very surprised with the turnout. Yun nga lang nakapagod po siya kasi calls, phone calls po siya. Pero it was liberating kasi nakatuwa yung sharing nila na how, yung experience nila, how did I study for this disease? Uh, I would be uh, very interested to also to learn from others. Paano nga ba natin iiwasan yung ganong pagod kung ito ay masyado nakakapagod? And are there other alternatives? Perhaps we can listen from ano, others. So, gusto ko lang sabihin na kung the consortium will actually put up a portal, uh, not only should you be sharing uh, resources, but also lesson plans or like how to do a phone assessment. Uh, maybe Len can write that down. What were the yeah. questions that you shared, etc. Okay. Uh, it becomes now uh, an experience that I think no one has but you. And then now we can ask others to do it and see how it turns out. Thank you, Dr. Balolong and Dr. Isip Tan. So we have we have had a very interesting, very lively and productive discussion. Um, I think a uh, uh, take home message from this webinar is at this time we really have to be creative. But I hope this webinar was high yield to everyone. Uh, uh, due to the interest of time, we now have to close this webinar. But there's a pressing question from our uh, viewers if the presentations of uh, Dr. Balolong and uh, Mr. Ong can be shared. So we will just post an announcement um, to the consortium for the sharing of the lecture materials. But as for Dr. Isip Tan's uh, lecture, uh, you will see later the link wherein you can access her presentation. Now, to officially close this webinar, we would like to hear from the PSM president, Professor Joel C. Cornista. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so on behalf of the Philippine Society for Microbiology National Board, I would like to thank the MCC or the Microbiology Consortium of the Philippines for organizing this webinar on blended flexible learning in microbiology. Of course, again, we would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Iris um, Tan, Dr. Marilyn Balolong, Professor Jan Daniel Ong, and of course, we also like to thank our moderator, uh, Dr. Les Dalmasio, for facilitating this morning's webinar. Okay? We really appreciate the very informative talks from the different speakers on how <clears throat> to shift to a blended or flexible learning in microbiology in the times of this pandemic wherein we are trying to move to a new normal. Today's webinar is just a beginning of the series of webinars that we have planned for you. So we would like to request to please update your memberships with MCC. Uh, you can ask your deans, your chairs for the existing MOUs and MOAs so that you will be notified in our future activities of the MCC, not only of the MCC, but also of the PSM. Again. I would like to thank everybody for attending this webinar and have a nice day. Thank you very much to all of you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Kunita. <clears throat> and thank you to everyone who participated in this uh, first webinar of the Microbiology Consortium. Um, I hope that through this webinar, we can all comfortably transition to being educator curators and guides on the side instead of being sages in the stage. Diba? So we encourage participants to accomplish the survey and evaluation form that can be accessed through the link flashed on the screen. 
the participants who accomplish the evaluation form will be entitled to receive a certificate of participation. <clears throat> also, please check the PSM Facebook account for future activities of the Society and the Microbiology Consortium. Muli, maraming salamat sa inyong lahat at magandang tanghali.